Well, uh, we might get the show on the road, uh, okay, okay. With, with, there's probably a few people out there trying to find a park. One problem with this place is that parking is fairly limited. Um, so, uh, thank you for coming today. This uh, event it was organised at very short notice, and um, the reason we uh, arranged it was uh, Cornelius, uh, our speaker here, and by the way, his name's Hempel, not Hem, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a problem with this projector. Every conceivable setting on the, the scene has been test tried, and you can't stop it cropping the image of it. So uh, we'll just have to live with that minor distraction. Um, but um, uh, Cornelius came to uh, our first two forums and uh, came to dinner after uh, the last one. And, uh, you know, we had about 15 people sitting at a dinner table. I was sitting at the opposite end from Cornelius. And uh, he um, had the other end of the table absolutely enraptured talking about quantum computation and related topics. And we uh, thought, gee, that's terrific. If only we could have a talk on that. So uh, I asked Cornelius, and he readily agreed. So that, thank you very much, Cornelius. Um, the, um, he's uh, <coughs> working at the cutting edge of uh, this field of quantum computation. He, um, you probably see his CV on the website, but it, uh, I'll just read it for anybody who hasn't. Cornelius Hempel is a research fellow in the Quantum Control Laboratory at the University of Sydney. He leads part of the research efforts in experimental quantum computing using trapped ions at the Sydney Nanoscience Hub. He holds a PhD in physics from the University of Innsbruck in Austria and was educated both in the United States and Germany. So, um, anyway, this... Uh, You'd be aware we, we started this, the broad theme for this year's series of philosophy forum talks is politics and the future of civilization. But uh, we opened, as you would be aware, with a, with a talk on artificial intelligence and its potential implications. And we thought, you know, you couldn't re can't really think in any long-term sense about the future of civilization without coming to grips with some of these transformative technologies which have, uh, have already changed the world profoundly but have the potentiality to change it a great deal more in the decades to come. So uh, artificial intelligence is one area but we um, uh, a great force multiplier for artificial intelligence is this uh, field of quantum computation which uh, has the potential to vastly outperform classical computers uh, in uh, performing a particularly certain tasks. And, and people have talked particularly about the possibility that uh, quantum computation could defeat all the uh, known current methods of cryptography. Um, the implications of that are quite extraordinary. But that's, that's just one aspect of it. So uh, Cornelius is going to give us a talk about... Uh, all that, and um, I, I hope you're all as riveted as the dinner guests at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the dinner after the last philosophy forum. So with that, I'll uh, introduce Cornelius and go and sit down and listen. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much for having me and for coming to this talk on short notice. Uh, yeah, it will be a pleasure to... Uh, show you a little bit what's behind this race uh, to build a quantum computer today and, as I say, curse of blessing for society. So I'm not really focusing on that so much, but I'll have a few items of you know, possible applications that these quantum devices can be used for. There are other things that are more of the philosophical nature. What does it really mean? What is quantum? And why some people would call it magic? And even I sometimes say it's the quantum magic, until someone's looking. We'll get into this a little bit. And so the way that I've built this up is that we'll be uh, yeah, having it in three parts. So the first one will be, as I said, the strange world of quantum. So the strange quantum world has basically two keywords that are the secret source to anything quantum. So when you build a computer, you build a clock, whatever it is that's quantum, 
It's making use of either superposition or entanglement or both. So those are the two secret ingredients that we have in the quantum world, and we'll be having a look at that. And some of you might know uh, a certain experiment, a thought experiment that involves a cat. We'll also be looking at that. Um, quantum problems and solutions. You know, I can tell you all about quantum and how great it is, but you know, I'm a scientist, so obviously this is what I'd be saying. It's, that's why I'm doing it. But why would we actually care about it? And what would be applications and problems that we might want to solve? Well, this is a problem that we might want to not have solved. So is quantum computing actually the end of privacy, or is it the beginning? There are actually some applications where it might be the beginning. But I'll get into this briefly. But then we'd rather love to talk about materials and chemistry, which are the two fields where I think quantum computing will have uh, the biggest impact by far, and will actually be very, very helpful. And will solve lots of our problems that we face today. But then after all of this talk, you probably want to know and wonder what does such a machine look like. So I'm going to show you at the very end what quantum computers today are made of, how to build one. And in fact, I'll be showing you the one that we built at the Sydney Now Center. Hub. And uh, then you've heard the term quantum so much, so there's a lot of hype around it. Uh, also, there's reality behind that hype, and so I'll briefly illustrate what's going on there at the moment. All right, so let's get into it and uh, see what the strange quantum world looks like, in which you can apparently ski around trees both ways at the same time. <laughs> Anyhow, let's go back a few hundred years. So seven, now we're in the 18th century, and we want to answer a simple question. So light, and you may have seen Newton, and then there's a prism, and you see a rainbow coming out, white light going in, rainbow coming out. Light was a wonderful, miraculous thing. 18th century was asked and really obsessed with the question, is, it, is light now a particle or is it a wave? And so our two uh, protagonists of this story are Isaac Newton, on the one hand, uh, who'd say, oh, clearly, it's a particle. No, no questions about it. There are corpuscles, and so I formulate hereby corpuscular theory. And then on the other side, we have Christian Huygens, a Dutch uh, physicist, um, who happens to not be Newton. And that was uh, clearly not to his advantage, because Newton, even back then, was a revered scientist, and then what Newton said was the law, if you will. And Christian Huygens, with his wave theory, didn't really have a breakthrough there at all. But then later, it took again 100 years till uh, the polymath Thomas Young uh, in Britain came up with an idea to test it. And so what he was proposing, uh, and actually even did, is what's now known as a double slit experiment, or Young's experiment. And what that is, is uh, a little <coughs> bed right here, let's call it a wall where we have two slits cut into it. So there are essentially two paths that an object or something could take. And if that said object were to be a particle, then we clearly expect that some make it to the left, some make it to the right, so you get two stripes here. If said object, in this case light, would be a wave, then you'd have this. So the wave would hit those two slits, and then would be blocked on these sides, and then each of the slits is basically creating a new wave. And when Thomas Young gave a talk at the Royal Society, this is a sketch he pre presented of this setup. So we have our two slits A and B down here. And then you get the stripy pattern, which we call interference. And you've all seen it, because when you, you've all thrown a stone into a lake, I presume, make it two stones, and you get one here and one there. And then the waves emanate, and you can see this uh, wavy pattern here. And even though this here was taken with light that gets put through that experiment, you can see those stripes. And they really line up with the places where the waves uh, constructively interfere, and then there are these destructive interference paths which lead to these dark points. But notably, in this double split, this brightest peak in the middle would be right behind this thing, but there should be nothing right here in the middle. So that's a clear way to show light clearly is a wave, right? It has to be. Now, fast forward again. Let's go another 100 years. We'll get to 1805, uh, sorry, 1905. And Louis Broglie actually, was a little bit later in his PhD thesis, asked, well, what, is, uh, what happens if we do the same experiment, but we take individual electrons? And we make it very clever. You can see I'm actually running the experiment for you right now, or it's a movie of it. We'll send each electron one at a time. So there'll be no two electrons that could somehow bump into each other. We'll just do that one at a time. And each time it hits, it creates a dot here. <coughs> and we'll see what forms. But how did he get that idea? That idea actually goes back to Albert Einstein. So uh, we all know him as the father of relativity, EMC squared, one of the most famous equations, but that's not actually what he got his Nobel Prize for. His Nobel was for the discovery of the law of the photoelectric effect. And what that meant is that he described what happens 
when light hits a metal, and then electrons come out of that metal, and that description irrevocably said, well, light is a particle, it's not a wave. And so that was basically the idea, well, what is it? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? We don't really know. And that's how Louis de Broglie in his uh, PhD thesis said, well, I'll just take those ideas, and I'll propose we do that with electrons. And uh, back then it was too hard to do, so this is actually the most modern version of it in 2013. But you can see, even though we just shot single particles, single electrons, one at a time, at this double slit, we still see this fine pattern. So now what is an electron? Is it a wave? Is it a particle? Good question. And uh, this question you know, has been with us ever since. And just again to recap, we'd say, okay, this is classical world, this is what we'd expect. And somehow when we make things really small, when we go to individual atoms and particles, electrons, this is what we see. And these days, these experiments uh, have been continued, because the question obviously is, does size matter? I mean, can I run into a double slit and come out and you know, go through two doors at once? And you know, somehow that doesn't seem to happen. And so colleagues in Vienna have done these experiments now with really large molecules. So if you sum up all those numbers, there are many, many atoms. I think by now there are 800 something atoms. So reaching sizes of, that are basically like a virus in size, these molecules. And you send them through a double slit, and that's what you get. So somehow that works, but only if no one's watching. So there's this thing in quantum mechanics that if we try to take a peek, if we put someone right next to these slits, <laughs> we say, okay, if it goes through your door, you'll raise your hand. If it doesn't, that's all right. Okay, we'll make it more interesting. We'll not have the person there because we don't really trust people. And we'll put a camera there. The camera is powered next door. There's a plug in the wall, and it's fine. Yeah, we have it plugged in. We are watching. We're watching you. And so then we do the experiment. That's what we get. Uh, but we haven't plugged it in. Okay, let's plug it in. And once you plug it in, this emerges. So somehow the very moment that we know which way that particle has gone through, if we take the left or the right and slip, all the fingerprint is gone. This pattern is gone, and we get our classical information back. So somehow the mere uh, uh, act of looking seems to be what creates reality. And that science seems like an upsetting statement, an upsetting, unsettling statement, not just to you, also to Einstein, who then asks, well, is the moon not there when no one's looking? So this is really very, very strange. And Einstein, even though he was one of the people that came up with the founding equations of all of quantum mechanics, he hated it until the very end. In fact, he proposed experiments, and very big experiments, that was always trying to disprove, because this notion of reality uh, not being there you know, when, you, when you look, things are changing. Is the classical real when no one looks? Uh, the classical real? Yeah, that's a good question. How would it, you know it, if no, no one looks? I mean, does it happen when no one looks? Do you get that effect when no one looks? So you get you get that effect when someone looks for the quantum object. And in the classical world, if I do this with models and in the microscopic domain, you always get that effect. You never get this moment. Sorry. When when do you move from that to that? If that's someone precisely, is there. That's precisely the question. Is, yeah. it, is it a question of size? Yeah. Or what we do know is that if you're looking, if you're taking a peek, you never get that. So that's as much as we know. But there's even more, and I'll have that at the very end. You can actually try this at home. You can do what's called a quantum eraser experiment. You need a laser pointer and a little wire, more to that at the end. But you can do that, and the whole idea is that if you find out, if you label it somehow, right door and left door, you have that information, and this is what you see. But then you destroy that information. This immediately comes back. So the moment you can obtain information, as long as the information is not known and you really destroy it, this re-emerges. And there's something called, this is even more crazy, um, <laughs> Wheeler's delay choice. So the a physicist who suggests, well, it's all very well on Earth, let's do that out there in the universe. So let's imagine there's a star, it's not imagined, we know there's a star, uh, but the light maybe was produced 30 million years ago, and then it comes towards us. So this was a long time, long time ago. It passes a black hole, or some object, where it can go either left or right. And now we look at it. Now, because we are looking now, are we affecting something 13 million years ago? Exactly. So there is a whole lot of craziness attached to this. And uh, this might seem very strange, this principle of superposition of going to two things at once. Uh, do you want to go up this, please? Yeah. Um, what do you mean by no in no, this no. context? Is it a matter of the quantum effect disappears when you've got some device that actually records it? Or is it when somebody 
is looking at the information from that device. It's even worse. You can have the device recording the information, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether we look or not. It's, it's, it's enough that the information is recorded and reliably destroyed. It's coming. So, yeah, but this is all very weird, but let me tell you, you've been exposed to this for longer than you think. Because atomic clocks work that way. So this is exactly how we measure time. So when you, the first uh, atomic clock actually was built in 1955 by Louis Essen in NPL in, uh, in London. That's what it looked like, and back then everyone wore a tie, and they're, you know, this is how you do it, not these days. But anyhow, the clocks work the same way. You have an atom, and you bring the atom in a superposition of two energy states at once, let it sit there for a while, and then you measure. That principle hasn't changed. It's called the Ramsey experiment, and that's what powers every single atomic clock in the world. And you might actually have used one of these things on your way here, if you didn't know how to get here. You may have used a GPS. All of the GPS satellites actually have a little box that looks like that inside, and inside that box is an atomic clock that uses the same superposition principle. And then all GPS satellites emit the time, basically, so just clocks that emit the time. And you record the timestamps when the signal gets to you, and because they also said where they were, you can triangulate where you are on Earth. So all that uses uh, time. And there's some old story about relativity and how time shifts when you move fast, but I'm not going to get into this. If you want to know more about time, we can talk later. At this point, let me just point out that clocks still look very much like a big object. You can also make them much smaller these days. And there are now these numbers don't have to mean anything to you. This is just a normal atomic clock ticks accurate to the 16th digit after the decimal point. And these days, also using the same superposition principle, we can make clocks that tick the 18th decimal digit. Now, why does anyone care about this? The funny bit about this is if you have a clock and it sits here, and then you lift it up by 30 centimeters, it takes faster because it's farther away from Earth. Gravity is weaker up here. My arm is actually, time goes faster up here than down there. And with such a clock, you can see that. And in fact, that's what people have been doing. Yes, please. Just going back to those questions on looking, if you agree, science is a quantum theory. Looking actually involves interacting, so you've got to send at least one photon onto the electron when it's going through one hole or another. And because the photon hits the electron or the electron wave, whichever way you want to look at it, randomly, you get the loss of the coherence which you need to have the interference. So looking is not just mental thinking, it's actually interacting with the object yep. going through the two slits with yep. a photon, the minimal interaction. And that interaction... Just, just hang on. Yeah, can we reserve questions for the discussion period? Tanula is going to have a battle getting through this. <laughs> but we'll get back to that, definitely. Okay, so let's move on to the, to the next weird thing. And that basically meant that um, all this weirdness is really strange. And I would like to quote Evan Schrodinger here in 1952, where he said, well, we never experiment with just one atom or a particle. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we could, but this always leads to ridiculous consequences. And because I put up Evan Schrodinger, some of you might know what that goes towards. Yes, this, this experiment. Very malicious, but rest assured, this is a thought experiment. No actual animals were harmed, and Schrodinger never had a cat. So, all good. Um, but basically, if you've not seen this yet, so what this means is uh, we're doing, so we're imagining a thought experiment in which a, an atom is inside a box. This is a Geiger counter. If the atom decays to another particle, it makes a click, and the click will then release a hammer that hits uh, a little bit of poison, and the poor cat in the box, well. Now, this is the experiment. They both go in, and we close the door. And now what we do is we wait. We know that these atoms, they have what's called a half-life, so they don't just decay, but we can say on average, after about that, that time, the atom will have decayed. So we just wait. Okay, we've reached the half-life, now what? Is the cat dead or alive? Well, and the answer to this question in the quantum mechanical sense is, it's both, it's dead and alive at the same time. And yes, it is that weird, and that's exactly why Schrodinger put it forward, because he wanted to illustrate, so he never meant that seriously. He was basically saying, look, if the quantum world were a part of our world, that's how strange things would be. And so what better can you use than a very nice, friendly animal to illustrate how crazy and strange that is? Nonetheless, 1996, that's exactly what physicists did. You take an atom and you put it in two places at once. And there's one thing more. 
So the, uh, that goes into this, and this is called entanglement. And that basically means that the fate of the cat, you could say, is entangled, is connected to the fate of the atom. So if the, if the atom decays, the cat is dead. So that's that one. If the atom is uh, alive and well, so it's the cat. So these two become what's called entanglement. And entanglement is really strange, and because I can say that as often as I want, don't listen to me, listen to... If the time time. reversal symmetry destroys the notion of time, then entanglement crushes our experience of space with two objects. Two electrons created together are entangled. Send one to the other side of the universe. Now, you have to the one, and the other responds instantly. <laughs> so, either information is traveling infinitely fast, or, in reality, they are still connected. They are entangled. And, since everything was entangled at the moment of the Big Bang, that means everything is still touching. Space is just a construct that gives the illusion that there are separate objects. Are we far enough down the rabbit hole yet? <laughs> exactly. So you can see we can take this discussion and we can go anywhere into any rabbit hole, really. And that's, by the way, taken from this movie, which was creating some animations. And it's always nice to illustrate what these things are in comics, and then have a discussion that goes very deep, and you can go down any rabbit hole, if you like. But you can also say, well, okay, let's just use it. So let's just use it. And so now what we're doing is, we're using this quantum entanglement, in this case between photons, between particles of light, and we are creating a secure communications channel. And in fact, that's recently been done over very large distances. So there's a satellite that China launched in 2016. Austria planned to do that 10 years before that, and they're still talking. So <laughs> they just made it happen. And Jacques uh, Khan is leading those research efforts in China. He happens to be a PhD student of Akutsalia in Vienna. So they set up a phone call, encrypted by a satellite that was in orbit, and the distance between the two places was 7,800 kilometers. What they did is they created an entanglement between the ground station in Austria and the satellite, and between the satellite and the ground station in China. And you can find these quantum communication networks actually already commercially. You can buy one of these things. They run through fiber optic cables in larger cities. Banks use them. That's actually a commercial product now. That all relies on entanglement. It doesn't say anything about why, how, and how it really works, but it just puts it into a usable device. So entanglement can be something very useful, and if you think about it in the sense of computing, we're talking about the edges of the universe. It doesn't need to be. Let's think about a little small-scale computer, and let's say we use that, and then we make a big data center, so we have another computer at the other end there, and now we want them all to, to work together to solve the problem. Now, I have a bigger problem, so I need another computer. My data center grows. Eventually, the cables between the computers just get too long, so you can't really transfer information that quickly anymore. But entanglement, it doesn't need space. It just works. Once you have entanglement in two places, it doesn't matter how far apart they are. And so that's also what powers these quantum computers. If you can create entangled states, imagine a big spreadsheet, and you turn one number at the top left. Instead of adding one to every column one by one, you just do this here, and everything gets updated instantly. And so this is very weird and very strange. And actually, all I'll leave you with there, because we have a lot to get to. Quantum problems and solutions. So what do we want to do with devices like this? And the first one that I talked about was cracking codes. And that brings us to the basis of modern encryption. And a little math problem for everyone who's interested and who might be able to tell me what that is. You may have guessed that it's that. And we can up the stakes a bit here. Maybe not as you know, three times seven. And in fact, what this means is you take any number, and say 42, and you can break it up into factors that you multiply. You can break these up into more numbers, and you can do that to any number. Any number can be factored into, if you look at these, prime numbers. And here's a list of prime numbers down there. So those are the solutions. And because I've just given you the solutions, you should be able to tell me about this. <laughs> Quite easily, right? It's all there. See, 67 times 53. 
Well, you may have been someone who would be able to guess that, but then I'll just give you that, that question. <laughs> and that is now a number with 129 decimals. It's a large number, and you can try to factor this, or you can just trust me that that's what comes out. It's still not quite with that. So it's a hard problem, and in fact, this problem was posed in 1977 as a question, and it took till 1994. 600 volunteers, 1,000 on computers, and eight months to solve this problem. They made $100. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot of effort. And in fact, these problems are so hard that three uh, mathematician pathologists got together, so RSA, so Ravis Jamir and Edelman, uh, and the encryption algorithm that they devised based on this hard math problem is called RSA, and the company turned that into a product. In fact, when you go around the world and meet people from governments, they very often have a little keychain edition like this. This is an RSA key, so they carry that with them, and every hour or so, the key rolls over to a new one. But it's all based on solving hard problems. And so they thought, well, let's just put this out there. This is a state of the art, now not any longer state of the art, but used to be military grade encryption. And if you could crack that number, you could solve you know, cryptography problems, or get or end get two hundred thousand dollars. It's so hard. Uh, the hardest one that was solved was in two thousand nine. That was seven hundred, uh, and well, I think seven hundred sixty-eight bit. And this is two thousand forty-eight. They took the problem away. No one can really crack it. And so that is a really hard problem and great because that means cryptography is safe. No one can guess based on those uh, those numbers what our keys are. And then 1994 happened. And that is when Peter Shaw, who worked at Bell Labs back then, uh, discovered an algorithm that could use a quantum computer and would exponentially speed up that solution. Just to give you an idea what that means and how it works, if you have a normal computer that wants to try this math problem, you just try it one by one. Okay, we have 10,000 normal computers, they all try all possible combinations, so you can still do one by one. And that takes an exponential amount of time. L is the length of the of the key. If you make the key really long, it takes longer than the age of the universe to do it one by one, or even if you do a hundred at a time, or a million at a time, it still takes ages. Now, when you do a quantum computer, what you do, when you have one, you can take the problem and remember this superposition principle, many ways to get from A to B, if you can somehow set it up such that some of these ways, like in interference with waves, some of these waves cancel, so some of these solutions cancel, and others remain, get amplified, then you can solve the problem. And effectively, you've used the set of all solutions, and you came up with a good algorithm to bring them together, and I'm hand-waving this. So you can see it's actually quite complicated, which is why it took a while until Peter Shaw came up with this. Now, this was 1994. Everyone was really excited. That Deutsch is another name, so physicists and theorists at the time were really excited. So were these two that attended a talk in Boulder, the ICAP conference in 2000, uh, 1994, and Peter Zoller and Ignacio Villar, they were saying, okay, now what would you need to build to make such a machine? And they came up with a proposal to do that using what had just been put together as a clock, an iron trap experiment that was meant to measure time. And so David Weinland, who also happens to be in the Boulder area, it's called Rado, it's quite nice, um, he uh, made that experiment happen in the lab. So the first quantum computer was proposed and demonstrated. And that's when it really started getting attention. And you can imagine who was the first to invest, and who still happens to be a very, very big investor today, the alphabet soup of agencies that want to keep their secrets. And what they really want to know is, can one build a quantum computer in 20 years' time? They don't really care about having one straight away. They just want to know, 20 years ahead, can one build one? Because then we need to change our encryption keys today. So that's where all the financing came from. And so that's one of the applications, but honestly, I don't really care about that. So most of my colleagues, uh, we all care about something else. What we care about is quantum simulation. So we want to use a quantum computer to simulate a quantum system. And so that idea goes back to 1982, and Richard Feynman said this quotation, basically, or he said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. And God, he was right. <laughs> so if you took a normal computer, Bad idea. Better take a quantum simulator. And you can see we've been trying that for quite some time. The first demonstrations took 20 years almost just to make that happen, even in principle. But that's the way to efficiently simulate a quantum system. And at the basis of most of these applications, 
that's what you need. That's a quantum system that you need to describe. So now let's try that. Let's make a magnet. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what the problem is, but let's make a magnet in a very easy way. We'll take a little atom that is magnetic, and we'll take one of it, so it has two states, north pull up or north pull down. So because quantum mechanics, you know, this superposition thing, we always need to keep track of all the possibilities. So we'll just write down two numbers. It's like 70% up and maybe 30% down. So two numbers, not a problem. Take the second atom. Now we have a magnet made out of two atoms, and we have four combinations. So we need to write down four numbers. But we want to get to a magnet, and these magnets have trillions of atoms. So we'll just keep doing this. And someone keeps uh, you know, keeps a lockbook, probably at some point on the computer. But once we reached 30, and then 31, 32, you can see what happens to the memory, to the amount of num to the amount of numbers just that you need to write down the code, just to write down what the state of the system is. And this is called, you know, some people call it an exponential explosion. But that's basically the reason why quantum mechanics can't really be simulated efficiently. And in fact, if you wanted to do this. You can get one of the supercomputers at the time, this is 2007. They managed to simulate 36, but they could just store it. That was it. They couldn't really calculate anything with it. And now doing some new mathematical tricks. 2018, we're up at about 50, but 51, it's not going to happen. Well, 51, maybe. 52, very unlikely. So it remains a super hard problem. And even with a supercomputer, you can maybe store it, but then the things that we want to simulate, we want to maybe simulate a chemical reaction. We need to run that simulation multiple times, and if it takes maybe a month to run one, well, we want to go to the next time step. Another month, another month. So this is not really feasible to simulate quantum systems. But we want to build a quantum computer, easy. Now, that might be an academic, an academically interesting problem, but if you want to convince someone to invest, you need to have a slide like this. So this is a slide where I say a billion dollar device needs a billion dollar application. And in fact, there are many global problems that quantum computers could have an impact in. There's energy, health, and food. And we'll take a closer look at these. So let's start at energy. And like I said, billion dollar problem. So we always need to have a billion somewhere on this slide. It's about the solar energy market. And what's the problem here? So the problem is, if you want to transfer electricity from A to B, you need to run it through wires. And just in the US alone, 8 to 15% of the electricity are lost in transmission. They're just lost in the wires. The same way that when you turn on your heater in the bathroom and it produces nice heat, that's a loss. You know, that same thing happens in all those long cables. And you can actually build a cable that does that lossless. This process is called superconducting. So once you have something in a superconductive state, it means there are no losses, no heating anymore. So people try to make wires out of that. And but it's very hard because the superconductors that do that at reasonable heating temperatures are usually ceramic. Now, trying to make a cable out of a ceramic object is not that easy. And so trying to describe how superconductivity works and to create better materials to do this will require a quantum simulation and hence a quantum computer. And if you care about the billions because you're an investor, here's your number. Now, we can move on to health, where this happens to be the problem of describing what this molecule does. I mean, you know what it does, but before we had that, we had no idea that it did that. Then Ibuprofen you might also have taken at one point. Um, again, it's a it's a molecule with lots of atoms, and describing that is very hard. What you see here is the drug discovery schedule, roughly. How long does it take a um, pharmaceutical to be developed, and then to be finally arriving at the market? You're looking at 10 years. And the first two to four, roughly, are nothing but saying, okay, that could be a viable option. Let's look at that molecule. Okay, what are the properties of that molecule? Well, we can't calculate it, so we start measuring it, measuring it, measuring it. Two weeks later, we go to molecule number two. We do the same game because we can't calculate it, and so on. So classification of molecular compounds is a huge problem, and a lot of this is trial and error. And so that's where a quantum computer could come in, and it could just simulate that. If it were, large enough. And lastly, food. This is one of the most cited examples, and most given examples, and that's fertilizer production. So as it happens, billions of people rely on fertilizer to have enough crop to be able to harvest uh, and feed them. And um, the harvest wash process from 1910 is what we still use today. So that's what humans use when they try to make fertilizer. So ammonia, combination of hydrogen and nitrogen. Nitrogen we take from the air, hydrogen we get from oil wells and other places. 
And you've got to heat it up to 500 Celsius, and huge pressures have to be involved, 20 megapascal, and then you pump it through a chamber, where there's this weird thing in the middle, this is called a catalyst, it's made out of metal, and that's where the liquid will start to condense, and that liquid is your fertilizer. But it's so expensive to make this, it takes a lot of energy, that when the financial crisis hit, the price of fertilizer skyrocketed. And that was nearly, and this is down here, uh, because the energy prices went up. So some fertilizer plants on the planet had to shut down, actually quite a number of them had to shut down during this time, because it was too expensive to make this. Now, we leave the center and we look around us, and we see there are trees growing. Now, how is this? You can make good fertilizer out there. How can nature can grow without us? Well, there are plenty of bacteria that do that at atmospheric pressure and not high temperatures. Now, it was not really known how that worked for a long time. And then it was discovered that these bacteria have an enzyme called nitrogenase. And uh, nitrogenase has this little secret ingredient here in the middle, in there, as a molecule like this, using uh, iron, molybdenum, and then <coughs> all this complex. Um, and this molecule is great because that's what makes the magic happen. So this is what makes what bacteria have to make fertilizer to bind and make ammonia by nitrogen. And we have no clue how it works. We have no clue how to put it together, how this bacteria do it, and there's no way to simulate it. But as I was saying earlier, these are big problems and big questions. So in fact, in 2017, Microsoft sat down a bunch of theorists and they calculated and went through the math to figure out if you had a quantum computer of just a few hundred well-working qubits, you can solve this problem. You can simulate that molecule. Now, any supercomputer in the world can't, but a fairly moderate-sized quantum computer could. And so that tells you why so many companies these days are trying to get to the market. And in fact, if we just go to one of the supercomputer centers and see what are they doing, most of them run simulations of chemistry materials, some physics as well, and that's the majority of the time in most supercomputer centers. So this really is, a, is an important problem. And in 2015, excuse all those numbers, uh, that was an effort, just the development of a quantum computer that was worth on the order of $2.4 billion compared to other efforts it's not really much. You can't even build a, like a, a military craft for that. It's cheap compared to this. Uh, yet, lots of countries are trying to get into it, and Australia is also part of, the, part of it there. Uh, there's a lot more investment that goes into this uh, these days. And the 360 million you see here is only maybe a third of what's actually happening. Just the other rest, no one talks about. <laughs> and so this is... Uh, basically what we could do with such a machine. Now, what does that look like? And I think I should probably also speed up a little bit. So, let's build a quantum computer and build back one out of atoms, because we know atoms are these things when we throw them to a double slit, they'll make this interference pattern, they're quantum somehow. Now we need to get those atoms, so step one is to go to the periodic table and uh, make an educated guess. So the educated guess means we take one of these atoms, here that are highlighted, because they have two electrons in their outer shells. So if you think about the atom as like this little planetary system where the electrons was around, uh, there's one where there are two on the outside. You take a laser, we kick out one, so we're left with a charged atom, that's also known as an ion. That's great, because a neutral atom is not so great. You can't really hold on to it, it's neutral. But if it's charged, great. So let's just hold on to that atom, and we do that by, you know, taking the atom, this is our, the ion in this case, the positively charged ion. We take two positive voltages, it uh, gets repelled, we trap it, ha, falls out the side, not a problem, we just put electrodes there. Now, would that work? Well, if you go through physics lectures, there's something called the Earnshaw theorem, and you look at it, it's like, uh -huh, yeah, one of those exercises. And then you go into the lab later, that's what happened when I did my PhD, I went to the lab, like, ah, this thing really means something, because that does not work. <laughs> what you need to do instead is, you need to have positive on one side, and the, and the atom would fall out, so you just switch the voltage around. Now you have positive here, and you do this fast enough all the time. And this is effectively what happens. The atom or the ion tries to escape, but you've been you've been switching back and forth, so it effectively is trapped in this. So it's a, this is called a, an ion trap. It was actually developed uh, in the 80s by these two gentlemen in my bed. And is also what you'll see at an airport. Well, you don't really see it, but when they take a little swap and when you see whether you have touched any explosives. They'll take your whatever they swap, and then they run into one of these things that are called mass filters and mass spectrometers. And ion traps are basically nothing but a mass spectrometer, but you plug the two ends so the poor ion in the middle cannot escape. 
And now, how do we make a computer out of that? Well, we need more than that, uh, more than just a single one. And because these ions, they're trapped inside this trap inside the vacuum vessel, which we'll see later. Uh, so we need to manipulate them somehow. But how do you reach in and turn it? Well, you don't. You take laser beams, and this is what happens. This is pretty much what it looks like. And in 2005, we had the first quantum byte uh, in Innsbruck, so eight atoms sitting there. And then this is what it looked like a little bit later when we reworked the imaging and made it a little bit better. And now when our quantum computer runs, this is just an illustration of what an algorithm does, so something happens. And if you were to watch it in operation, this is the very exciting movie, Quantum Computer in Action. It's a bunch of blinking. Because we are in the classical world. When we look at it, it's either bright or dark. It's not one or the other. We can't really see superposition. When we look, this, this concept about creating reality that was alluded to earlier, but when we measure, it goes to one or the other. So in order to turn this into a useful device, we need to do this a number of times. And then we just record the individual images that our camera, our trusted camera, has captured. And then we say, OK, so here the answer is that. And you run that a thousand times, and then you get the statistics, and then you know roughly what your quantum information is. But that also tells you that quantum mechanics is a statistical thing. So if you want to calculate 2 plus 2 and get 4, you better take your classical calculator. The quantum calculator will do that too. It will give you an answer that probably says, oh, it's 3.98. Plus, minus, give or take, 0 0.0. <laughs> if you measure a million times, it will be a bit more accurate. But you know your calculator is better for that kind of job. But the other applications that I've shown you earlier, they really want a quantum thing. But then we need to ask the question repeatedly. And so labs like this, uh, where we have devices like this, look like that. So of course, you always want to have a great architecture. So this is our new fancy Sydney nano signs up that they put there. And I must say, this is what brought me to Australia. It has one of the best environments in the world to actually build such a lab. So this lab down here is where, where we house our home computer. And this is my PhD student, Alistair, whom I built this trap with. You can have a sense of scale. So inside here is a little device that can. And this whole uh, metal chamber here, this is a vacuum chamber, because I have told you earlier they do these experiments with these atoms that they still uh, very large objects and the slit, double slit experiment, and you still see the quantum effects, but only if no one's looking. That is because they do them in chambers like this. They pump out all the air, so all these atoms they can just fly and feed it. Nothing gets hit, nothing gets in the way, so nothing can obtain the information from where the atom was. So in order to keep the quantumness in there, you need to keep everything else out. So no air. We evacuate this. We build this little spaceship. If you will. And then we put it on the table, and the table looks like this, roughly. So you can see there's a whole bunch of things around it there just to bring in laser beams. And this large, big, bulky thing is what you'd see on the sports grounds. The photographers have a very large objective, such as this. This is a very fancy, if you will, microscope objective that looks inside here. And that's the heart of the thing. That's the ion trap. Uh, and these, these blades, these electrodes, where they put the voltages on to confine them, they're uh, gold-coated titanium in here. This thing that looks like plastic is actually a single crystal sapphire yeah. that we put together. And let me tell you, it was no fun to bring that to the customs. But uh, <laughs> we got it eventually, we made it. And so now we're trapping uh, atoms in there, or ions in there. And that's an image taken in our lab. And one more thing that we do, but I won't have time to explain it to you, is we use lasers to cool these ions down. So even though everything else here is at room, room temperature, the ions themselves have a temperature of minus 273.149 Celsius. So we really cool them down. You can see, somehow temperature matters. And it does matter not just for ion trap computers, also for the other contenders, supernova computers. And you can see, uh, Jeff, what's his name, from IBM. Uh, and you see these in the news these days, very often. What this is, is nothing but a fridge. Because if you take a circuit, it looks like that, you put it on a chip, and then you take that chip and you stick it into this can down there, and you make the whole thing really, really cold to this temperature. You're actually a bit colder than they Anyhow, they have a real fridge. And so their real fridge brings it down to this temperature. That's when these chips also become quantum. So now suddenly currents can flow in two ways. They can go left and they can go right at the same time when it's really cold. So this is what superconducting uh, quantum computers look like today. And yeah, there have been some comparisons, and as I said earlier, ion traps have been around for so long. So if you look at some numbers, and I don't want you to read the slide in detail, uh, but basically ion traps still 
this number is larger than that, that's all you need to take away. So iron traps still work really well. And they have a connectivity where every qubit can talk to every other qubit. So entanglement can be established over the whole range. Whereas here, you need wires between the things to actually reconnect them. So that's limiting superconductors right now, but it's, it's an engineering problem. So these things get better. They get a lot better. And it's a chip. And chips are nice because you can mass produce them in clean rooms. And so now our iron trap, that didn't really look like a scalable computer. So our way to scale up is by scaling down. Now, we also make chips. And this is a euro coin, two euro coin, and that's the iron trap. It doesn't need to be that big. It can be a tiny chip, and you can trap an array of iron qubits in here, and then manipulate it with lasers. So everyone is now trying to get more qubits onto the space and still control them very well. And that brings me close to the end of the talk to the hive. So the current hive is a numbers game. You see, Intel um, is very good at announcing, they have a very good PR department, they have a seven qubit chip. Then they built a 17 qubit chip and a 49 qubit chip. So this is uh, Brian Sanich. Intel CEO just held that up at their uh, most recent conference. And, like This is our 49 qubit chip. They have not shown a single one of these qubits to actually work. <laughs> um, but they have the largest chip, or so they did for a while. IBM, on the other hand, is great. IBM has built a 5 and a 16 qubit device, and they've put it on the cloud. In fact, if you look up, look up IBM Q, you can program your own quantum computer. There is a quantum computer on the cloud. In fact, there are three on the cloud, and they're publicly available. So if you want to play with the quantum computers, go online. They don't charge you anything. You can ask the quantum computer questions and have experiments. Do that, run them in their lab in York and Heights. And they've announced the 50 qubit chip just because it's larger than 59. <laughs> <laughs> it's in testing at the moment. And I know what their 60 qubit chip looks like, so it's still a work in progress. Google is also in the game. They have nine excellent qubits. So these are really great. Google has made great, has achieved great results with those. And now we have a 72 qubit chip. Can you see them? So we actually sent them a tweet back, or you know, some, something in some form, and asked, so where's your actual chip? It's like, oh yeah, you know, the chip is underneath, but we can't really show it. And so it's true, because if you have a computer chip and you take a photograph and show it to your competitor, they can guess how you built it. So everyone tries to keep the lid on, but do these actually work? And just because we can, numbers game. This is a 50 iron crystal, 51 iron. So that's the last image I took in Innsbruck before I came here. And there we had control over 20 in the middle. So I call the 20 ones here qubits, and the rest I just call <coughs> iron ions. So this numbers game you can play, but you really need actual qubits that work. And so in that sense, <coughs> it's still pretty much going. But it has turned into, and that's what I called it earlier, the space race. So back then, the USA and the uh, Russian Union uh, were trying, the Soviet Union, were trying to get to the moon. And so we had the very fantastic imagination of what it could look like to build such a thing. And then the first quantum, oh no, the first rockets came and they <laughs> looked like this. And then eventually someone was put on the moon. And what many people don't know is, where does your power drill come from? The power drill was actually invented by Black and Decker, or just developed, uh, as a request of NASA. Because NASA found that if they send someone to the moon and they want to drill for a sample, it's very impractical to have a power cord. <laughs> so they built the first battery power drill. And that came out of the moon mission. So space race, yes, we also made it to the moon, but all these little things that came out of it, they have become so useful. And so the same is hopefully true for the quantum race. That's what's happening now. We have a lot more players, and they're not just nation states, there are companies, plenty of them. And we also have our album covers now. Probably the most recent article there. And the good things that came out of it are those atomic clocks. So the ones that are super precise came out of quantum physics research and the quantum rates. So we expect, I'd say, of course it's a hopeful expectation, but I'm pretty sure there'll be quite a number of technologies that come out of that that will be useful and not be quantum computer. So where are we now? There used to be the first transistor in 1947, and today we're here. And there was quite a development that went through that. You can see it took many, many decades. And I'd say for the quantum computing world, we'll be probably here, somewhere between 16 and 4,500 transistors. And it turns out somewhere in between here, computers became actually useful, like these silicon computers. So we are somewhere there. We just don't know yet exactly where and when some useful device will come out of it. But I'd put us somewhere there. And where are we in Sydney? In Sydney, we have two... Uh, Australian Research Council Centers of Excellence, one is ECRIS, so I'm part of, 
and then the C Center for Quantum Computation, Communication Technology, one at UNSW, one at Sydney. Those are the academic efforts, and then we have hardware efforts. Microsoft actually uh, rented out half of our building. They have created Station Q Sydney, which is their commercial effort to build a quantum machine. And then there's another uh, company called uh, Silicon Quantum Computing, and you can't really do that there. So you better know it. Um, their five-year goal is to build a 10 qubit prototype. So it's, it's, it's ambitious. They've shown so far one qubit, and they've put another one next to it, but they haven't really shown that they talk to each other. And they're trying to build this in five years, but they're using silicon technology. So it's a different kind of technology, and even though it looks like, ah, oh, iron traps are so far ahead, or superconductors are so far ahead, it doesn't mean anything. The technology can be this. It can be something we haven't even started building yet. So it's an exciting race. And software computer, software company, Q-Control, uh, is based at the Sydney Nanoscience Hub, and they are looking at software which doesn't really care about what your quantum computer looks like. It tries to make it better by changing the control. Right. And now I've spoken very long, so thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. If you want to know more or try something for yourself, I recommend this little YouTube clip here uh, by Kutzkazak. So if you just say quantum computers explained into Google, or we'll guide you to that clip. It's a very dense seven minutes, but it's really nicely done. And if you wanted to try this double slit experiment with photons, where information is obtained and then you throw the information away, and suddenly the quantum pattern comes back, you can try that at home. There's a nice article, Scientific American, May 2007, how to do that yourself at home. With a little wire, a laser pointer, and two polarizers. And if you wonder what polarizers are, if you've been to a 3D movie and got one of these, take it home with you. These two glasses are polarizers, and you'll need them to do this. You have to pay for it, or you go here, and then you get it, and you can download that. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions.